Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Welcome to our continued coverage of this year's Academy Awards. Like last year, we have compiled interviews with each of the nominees in the Best Sound category. The nominated films this year are Belfast, directed by Sir Kenneth Branagh, Dune, directed by Denis Villeneuve, the latest James Bond adventure, No Time to Die, directed by Kerry Joji Fukunaga, The Power of the Dog, directed by Jane Campion, and West Side Story, directed by Steven Spielberg. So each of these interviews is taken from clips uh, from full episodes that we have done over the past few months, exploring the sound design and the mix of each of these remarkable movies in quite a bit of depth. So if you like what you hear here, you can go back and find these full episodes by searching through our back catalog of podcast episodes. But as I said, we compile these into a single episode to make it easier for you to fill out your Oscar ballot, whether you are an Academy member or you simply wanna do a better job in your annual Oscar office pool. This is a big episode with a ton of special guests. So we're gonna jump right in. First up in alphabetical order is Belfast. This is from episode 104, which we recorded in December, and our guests were the writer, director, and producer himself, Sir Kenneth Branagh, supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Simon Chase, getting his first nomination for Belfast, Neve Adiri, the re-recording mixer who is getting his second nomination, and he previously won for Gravity, as well as supervising sound editor James Mather, who is receiving his first Oscar nomination for Belfast. Also nominated in this category is Denise Yard. So here's our conversation for Belfast. I feel like we could probably spend uh, a couple of hours just discussing and unpacking the first 10 minutes of this movie from a sound design perspective. And I, I do want to say, I think uh, deservedly, there's been a lot of attention paid to the beautiful black and white, uh, very rich cinematography of the film. But I'm really excited to be here having this conversation with you today, and especially, Kenneth, for you to join us to talk about the sound design, because I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening with the sound design and, and the mix on the film as well. Just to kind of focus on that, that opening of the film, uh, Kenneth, you know, you open the, the film with a, a montage of really beautiful shots of calm and beautiful modern present day Belfast uh, with a, a rockin' Van Morrison tune before we transition into black and white 1968. And I'd love for you to talk about like, what was your decision around opening the film and how to set up? That first 10 minutes is so critical in terms of putting the audience in the world and explaining you know, the language that you're gonna use to tell the story. And can you talk about the tone that you wanted to set in that first 10 minutes and with that opening and how you got into it? All beginnings, of course, are very important. And, um, you know, underneath the whole film, which mostly takes place in period Belfast, is this um, uh, sort of why we tell the story. And I think we, you, tell, you tell stories like this lest we forget uh, what happened, even though, as you say, the modern Belfast, which was important to present at the beginning of the film, is um, in this fragile but beautiful piece that's been so hard won from all the turmoil that went before. So in the first color section, the idea was to really, um, A, give us the musical voice of Belfast that was gonna dominate the film, that's Van Morrison. He's given us this new song, uh, down, down to Joy. Uh, and so it's meant to be quite a joyful um, uh, experience uh, before we go back into that darker time. And we already began seasoning inside the music all the other sounds of Belfast, which growing up, um, uh, and given that the perspective of the film is mostly through the nine-year-old boy, the things that I heard were, um, you know, the sounds of the docks, uh, the sounds of the birds, the sea is so close, Belfast is right on the lock, it's a huge port. Um, and we started immediately to have this sort of sense of vibrant life, both in the color, but also in the sound. Um, and a sort of celebratory, kind of very vital, very present sound picture was what we were after. But but subtle, because we knew that the first three movements were that, as it were, modern Belfast. And the second one was uh, harmonious or peaceful Belfast, uh, a street 
advertising this notion that it takes a village to raise a child. And then we go into the pivotal moment in the entire movie, which is when the world turns upside down because of violence coming into this otherwise, you know, harmonious place. Simon and James, can you talk about your approach to that opening sequence? And I just, it's so remarkable to me, I, as Kenneth so eloquently set up, you've got those that beautiful long tracking shot of Buddy going down the street and people calling his name. And it's just this remarkably peaceful, like just, it's just, it's just a, a wonderfully life affirming, joyous kind of neighborhood. And then it pivots in a moment and becomes a very, very dangerous, uh, violent place. And this is all happening, honestly, in the first like seven minutes of the film. So can you talk about the approach to, uh, to that opening sequence and that riot specifically? Yeah, thanks. We, 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 obviously it does start as, as, uh, Ken was explaining with this, this real positive, uh, vibe in the street. And, you know, that's enhanced. We got a lot of, uh, extra recordings from actors, both children, adults from Belfast to sort of enhance the, the shot that was already there in terms of adding in that friendly atmosphere. Obviously almost to the point of exaggeration, but, you know, that, this is a theme we'll, no doubt touch on a few times, you know, there's the realism and we talked to Ken, you can know, Ken, what were the sounds you heard growing up? And, and then there's also the memory of a child and what, and then the child's perception anyway is perhaps a little skewed. So you're, you're kind of already two steps removed and this very imaginative child this with a with bigger imagination. So sometimes we're going with real and sometimes we're hyper real. It was also, we were in a very privileged position to have Ken with us throughout the mix. So there was a lot of exploration um, throughout the process, but particularly that opening scene, if I remember rightly, there we had a music track there at one stage, which drove the energy and it was very dynamic and it was very, um, it, it, it kind of, it, somehow it, it kept us slightly removed, I think, a little bit from the action. And when, when Ken decided to strip the music out, the vitality and the, um, the presence of the community and where you were became much more real. You became much more engaged in it and part of it. And that was a, that was something that we just, that, that we've, I can't think of a situation where a mix where we've had that much collaboration throughout the entire day, every day. And it made the process much more, um, cognitive to us. I mean, it reminded me of my childhood, but being, playing in the streets and, and, you know, having fun, not having TV to watch, but, just being outdoors all the time and, and messing around being called in for tea and it just it, it's um it's a very nostalgic opening for me i think the film opens with a real sense of nostalgia that that tells you everything you need to know until the point of of crisis and then it's a whole different thing but without that setup the crisis doesn't have the same impact you kind of need to know that everything is lovely and wonderful and enjoyable and familiar a lot of people have asked me as I've gone along here, you know, why did you want to write it or what, what drove you to write it? And interestingly, given what we're talking about today, what I found myself coming up with is almost the reason I wrote it was to revisit the moment when I heard what seemed to be a sort of, um, it was in the sort of surreal 20 seconds where literally my life changed was to do with hearing. It was to do with, are those, is that a bumblebee I'm hearing? Are those bees I'm hearing? They're not. What are they? What is that fuzzy thing at the bottom of the road? Uh, those aren't bees. Oh, no, those are people. Oh, no, this is a riot. We had 
buddy coming down the street. And um, we, we recently played this to an audience, James and I, and spoke to them about it. And we asked them after the end of the whole film, let alone the whole riot, um, how many of you remember what's the sound Buddy's hearing just before the riot starts? And no one could really remember, which was kind of perfect because actually what happens is we, we flag it in the color section that there are trains and that, and that train sound po- pokes through. And it was interesting to me, will that stick in their mind? Because we start hearing a train. Now, of course, at this point, you don't know there's a riot about to happen. You don't know. And you're aware that there are trains in Belfast. And then the train's getting louder and louder and louder to the point of something's going on here. This this is now not natural. And um, so body's got a look in his eye. And and then suddenly the, um, the, the, the riot sound comes in, but in, again, a, a morphed way that you can't really tell what it is. And they're blurry in the background. So that... Um, moment then suddenly you, you, you it starts to dawn on you that there are people there and it's not a train and then suddenly your brain kind of forgets that there was that train thing but that acts as this sort of real stroke surreal bridge between those two worlds of uh, buddy was hearing something and he doesn't understand it it doesn't necessarily relate to um what what's happening but it's just a trigger to say something's changed here and Buddy's not got the grip on it. I mean, and a nod to the Godfather, obviously, that's always fun. I want to follow up on something um, that Kenneth, uh, you were saying, and and Simon, you were touching on as well, which is one of the things that happens in that opening sequence, and it's really subtle, but it happens very quickly, is you establish that you're going to use Buddy's POV from a sound standpoint. Uh, and it's right in that sequence when he turns around and he sees those people down at the end of the lane, Ken, as you as you talked about. But can you talk about I, I feel like throughout this entire film, there's so much um, that's happening. That's really from Buddy's point of view. And can you talk about using the sound design to put us in Buddy's? You know, it's almost like we're hearing the world as Buddy hears it. I think that's a good way of putting it. I think that um, we basically did our big shopping list of everything that you might hear before the riot and then everything that happens after the riot. So that is people shouting in na- neighbor neighboring streets, that is police sirens, that is uh, helicopters, that is uh, walkie-talkies, uh, that is other people running, that is the sounds of, um, you know, sort of urban clanking, smashing of trash cans and things, the sort of sense of being uh, overloaded by a moment, you know, this moment that started on August the 15th, 1969, uh, was led to, in that month of August, a greater displacement of a population in any city in Europe since the Second World War. So the, the, what was going on in that, in that city was sort of um, catastrophic. So it felt as though it gave us a lot of license to say that we we could we could hear the sounds relative to what we were seeing but beyond that that there was a kind of powerful um cacophony in in the in the surrounding streets in the air you know broken glass you know uh, that and and also another thing that that obviously given the title of the film is a character in the movie is the city of belfast itself city of belfast big industrial 19th century city where in 19th century in the sense of that's where it got its power from shipbuilding um you know railways uh factories making linens and cigarettes and all sorts and factory whistles and all the rest of it so we it was a, a license and a, the, in fact the, the way the process worked from my point of view would be with the boys to talk about stuff like this but then they went away to do an enormous amount of work and then would lay things out for me. And then, yes, obviously, my job is then to have a sort of editorial function in, in all of that. But um, it meant that there was a lot of room for their, at least I felt this, um, for their interpretive um, creativity relative to that sort of stimulus. And as I say, for me, the uh, what it meant was that in a, you know, relatively low budget film, uh, there, there was a chance to create what, what was happening for the boy, which was whether he liked it or not, partly because of the way his imagination worked from a peaceful street, he began to live in an epic Western story. 
uh, and that other sort of heightened quality of life seen and heard through the movies in the imagination of a creative kid sent us into that sort of non-naturalistic territory as well. I think another really important point is that it keeps simmering in the background. So there were there were very quiet scenes, you know, very moving scenes with scenes with just two people or three people. And the most important thing about the scene is is what's happening in the scene and the conversation, and beautiful little conversations and relationships, family relationships. And but in the background, you always there was always something simmering. If it was a shout or if it was a siren or a helicopter, and and again, what James said about having Ken in a room with us, which was, you know, absolutely uh, priceless, and it doesn't happen a lot, and. Um, so I think what I enjoyed most of it is that every shot we decided, okay, we're not going to have everything because the most important thing is the dialogue um, and the story. But let's have the sirens in this shot. Let's have just the helicopter on that on, in that scene. Let's just have birds in this scene and and just the sirens passing through. So you had the natural sounds and the environment and maybe a laughter, but um, the 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 danger and the st- the, the, the tension and the stress in the street kept simmering on and uh, and we could just sort of concentrate on one or two elements and um, but we could keep it going throughout and just just to connect to what Simon says you know y- he would have heard it all and obviously he can remember it all so he heard it all and it, it got right into his uh, you know got stuck in his mind um so I think that was a very clever a clever way to just keep the audience sort of you know, involved in the story, but on edge as well, to know that all this stuff is happening around them. Many thanks to Sir Kenneth Branagh and the team behind Belfast. Next up is Dune. This is from episode number 99, which we recorded in person last October with director, writer, and producer Denis Villeneuve. Supervising sound editor Mark Mangini, who is receiving his sixth Academy Award nomination for Dune and previously won for Mad Max Fury Road. Sound designer and co-supervising sound editor Theo Green, who is getting his second Academy Award nomination, and re-recording mixer Ron Bartlett, who is receiving his third Oscar nomination for Dune. Also nominated in the category uh, for Dune this year for Best Sound are Mac Ruth and Doug Hempel. This is a world built entirely from scratch, and that, that's the, the big challenge, but it, it starts with Theo, really, it starts with Theo because Theo is embedded with Joe and Denis during filming. And that's one of the the part of Denis's genius is he recognizes the value, as he was just mentioning, of sound informing his process. And Theo, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in the same way that if uh, an editor is using temp music, it's very hard for a composer to then come in and, and completely ignore what's been laid as a temp. But the same with sound effects, um, especially if you're dealing with sound effects that don't exist in the world that we live in. Um, so a spaceship or a technology like the shields that we see in in um, Dune, it's very important for him to, you know, he can't just reach into a sound library and put a temporary sound effect in there. And if he did, then it would be confusing to us uh, sound editors coming on later. So for him to be able to say, okay, these are the big ticket items. We need to hear what the voice sounds like. We need to hear what a worm sounds like, ornithopter shield. Uh, especially those elements that simply can't be recorded or found in a sound library. That allows him to start developing how those things look in the cut. It also allows him to pass those ideas to the VFX team and they can hear what we're working on and how those things might sound. So it's a collaborative process and if we came on much later and he'd been using temporary sound effects all the way through, I think we wouldn't have that uh, ability to inform his cut and the work of the VFX artists. And that's something which uh, um, Denis made possible by allowing Joe to bring us on early. That's something which, even on a studio movie, is not a a common thing. I mean, normally we're post-production, so the idea of starting that budget during production would normally just be refused. Yeah. But creatively, you get a much better product. I mean, you mentioned that it is, you know, there are, you know, a lot of people, a lot of producers kind of don't want to do that for financial reasons, but I think ultimately it doesn't necessarily have to be a much more expensive approach and you get creatively a much better product. Um, creatively, I, I think it's important, something you said last night, that by embarking on this non-traditional process, 
by the time you get to final mix, these sounds, I think you called them old friends. Yes, 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 uh, yes That's yes, a yes. very empowering um, situation for a director because the final mix should be a, a time when Denis can make the big, the meta decisions of, we got to focus on the dialogue, let's lower the music. And, and that's not the time when the director should be saying, I don't think I like the sound of the ornithopter. I don't like that, that rumbly thing. So this empowers Denis to really be his best at final mix. Tell me about the design, the, the sound design for the, the ornithopters. <laughs> that was... Um, a mono single effect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have it in stereo. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, in our first sound brief, um, Denis presented, you know, our challenges. They were fairly obvious, the big ticket items, the worm, the voice, the ornithopters, uh, shields, things like that. And um, Theo and I began to maybe parse who's good, who was going to be responsible for what, and somehow ornithopters fell to me. <laughs> And I was terrified because these it, it's 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 an unknown method of transportation and it uses wings and we don't even know what the propulsion is. I don't know if there's a battery or a motor or a couple of bugs in a box in there. I'm not, I'm not quite <laughs> sure what it was. But we, we as Denis described, Theo and I embarked on a, a very extensive experimentation process of trying to find the individual elements. What could we make wings out of? What could we make? propulsion sounds out of. Um, and it started actually during Theo's work in, during production, during filming, Theo recorded a, a beat, some beetle wing flaps, right? That was our first presentation of something organic because we knew what we didn't want it to sound like. It sh we didn't want it to sound like a helicopter or anything that we were familiar with terrestrially. So there were a lot of things not to do. So we thought, it looks bug-like. It kind of looks like a dragonfly, maybe. And Theo started those experiments and researching, you know, you were going to ship in, like, frozen bugs or something. Oh, it was <laughs> these Hungarian bugs that were in, I don't know if you remember, these things called poloshkas that they get, like, seasonal waves of these bugs. And um, other people in the studio were just kind of destroying them. And I, I saved one and recorded it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, bug wings, sure. But we also... I think uh, as a director from Denis, it's not to get too fantastical, not to get too. You know, we don't necessarily want it to feel like a like a like a creature. It's got to have the presence of a military craft. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 to contradict a bit uh, what Mark is saying is that it's true everything you said, uh, but at the same time, I wanted them to look to sound familiar in a way, not like not like an helicopter, but something that will not distract, something that will just feel n like natural to this thing which is like a technically a machine a powerful machine that is flapping in the air like <laughs> so it was a air movement and i will let you go go on on the recipe because me i love the way they did it but well <laughs> that's that's an important maybe footnote uh, because that was part of denise brief in terms of the the sound of the entire film everything should sound natural um we wanted a anything that we created to feel as though if you were actually there, that's exactly what it might sound like. You, you, it was a believable universe of science fiction. And th that was always an overarching driver to w the, the experiments that we would make. Where we would end up would be um, the wing flaps being made from uh, Theo's um, beetle wings processed and cat purring, uh, very, very close mic cat purring, so you get that <laughs> kind of... Uh, fluttering sound because that mimicked visually what we were seeing and then uh, layered again with the sound of a, um, a canvas strap from a tent um, strung in a 140 mile an hour storm so that you'd hear the flapping, the rapid flapping of a very organic piece of material that, that you could envisage as that maybe that's the sound of a wing. We would layer those sounds and then um, use processing tools to create the Doppler shift for passbys and ins and aways and constants while they're in the air. And then um, engine sounds were made almost entirely of bugs, mostly of bees, beehives, processed to add some of that flutter to it. The engine is modulating along with the wings, so we would flutter at the same rate that the wings would flutter at. And the mechanics made from mundane things, real things like the mechanics in my Chevy Volt, just you know, motors and things that 
sounded like things you you hear in real life. It's it's uh, I'm very proud of the sound of the ornithopter what they came and it came of course it was experimental sometimes they were it was coming and I was I was saying guys it's it sounds great but it's too interesting it's too too exotic too it feels too sci-fi in a way I, 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 when they came back with the, what you hear right now I feel it's grounded it's the actual real sound of an ornithopter so I feel it like it's like it was something that it came through a process but I think that that the, that crazy recipe is a total success I'm really uh, it, it's exactly what the, and in the same time it's it's not distracting it's powerful but it's not it's something that is linked to the nature of the vehicle. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's some uh, just specific sequences that I want to ask you guys about in a, about how the design uh, of those sequences came together. I, I would love to start with the voice. Um, it's such an important thematic element uh, from the book. Um, and uh, I have a feeling that you're probably going to tell me that this is one of those situations where you did a lot of experimentation uh, and it took a while to kind of dial it in. But can you, Denis, let's start with you. Like, the, the, obviously, the, the Benny Gesserit voice is a huge element of the film. And what were, what were your instructions to these guys as you were starting to explore what that I, was going to be? The truth is, uh, at the beginning, um, I was like, it, it's a fr frightening one. It's like, it, it's a scent, it's, a it's, it's, it's very, it's at the core of this idea that uh, um, the Binnish Desirate sisters are able to channel old ancestries. They are able to be in contact with the power of their genetics, those voices from the subconscious that influence our action in the daily business. They can channel them and actually use them for the, the, the better good to be stronger. So they, they, there was this idea of hearing ancient voices. Even when a man used a voice, you will still hear female voices, strong, strong, powerful, mean grandmothers talking. That I love the idea. <laughs> but, the but, 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 but how to approach this, we thought it sounded, uh, that it sounds silly, and how to, uh, to make sure that it will sound, um, that to find that balance between the subs and the, honestly, uh, it is teamwork. I mean, um, I uh, me, I was obsessed with this idea of the ancestor's voice, but uh, it's something that, again, as you rightly said, needed a lot of experiment from those gentlemen. And, and it was like an uh, uh, experiment in, in the editing room a lot. And we did, a thing I love also is that we, we are doing several mixes. It's, there's just not one dub. I mean, there's like, so you, you, we experimented in different, as different stages. Uh, different uh, approaches un until there was there was one where I finally f okay we got it, but it was it was something that took a lot of time yeah and it not it not something that we could add improvise over a weekend yeah there was like it uh, it uh, involved a lot of uh, uh, casting different uh, actresses the different performances um, and uh, and a lot of editing and a lot of uh, yeah it's, I don't know if the we we all took a an early go at what we thought the voice should sound like and presented various ideas to Denny and most of those were just treatments of the voice of the actor um, maybe putting a little reverb on them maybe putting a little bass on them and it wasn't until Mark came up with the suggestion that you know if we hear maybe an ancient voice and perhaps we hear a multitude of voices um, then that gives that sense of tapping into some sort of ancestral well of knowledge mm -hmm. Um, and we started recording um, with a voice uh, actor called Gene Gilpin. We experimented with that. The first thing I think we tried was just simply replacing the voice of the actor with another voice. And while that was interesting, it didn't convey the sense of power and you know an explosive force that someone using this voice on you would have. So that's when we started to experiment with a kind of impact, a bass, um, a sub bass layer um, that actually uses a trick that I, I learned from a dub reggae artist called Lee Scratch Perry, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, there's a technique of getting incredibly deep resonant basses where you literally just play the bass sound that you have as a source through a large subwoofer in a room and record that space. And you hear perhaps little rattles and you hear the space being affected. This, by is, what, this is what Walter Murch used to refer to as worldizing. It is. It's right? worldizing, yeah. but yeah. in you know with a subwoofer rather than with a full range speaker, um, and that became a very important element. But it wasn't until later in the process that when Denis had been experimenting with Joe Walker in the editing room that they came up with the idea of slipping the sync of that 
um, sub bass element so that it could convey how proficient a user of the voice is so that when Paul is learning to use it, it's not quite in sync and he doesn't quite have the effect uh, that, he, that he wants and, until he finally gets it later on and it's perfectly in sync and it, it feels very powerful and weaponized and that was something that really came in just in the final weeks and yeah, yeah i remember i brought uh, the, the idea to joe and uh, he tried it and i know i'm uh, looking at his face that it, <laughs> it's a <like>, whoa <laughs> no no it, it, it's uh, but we looked uh, at each other when we first yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no of course there's a huge element of that which is designed by ron bartlett and doug hempel who are working in the mix both pulling away elements so that it feels as if the room and its atmosphere have been sucked out. I love the way you use dynamic range uh, in this film, and I felt almost like uh, part of the design for the for the voice is that it it takes all the sound away before the voice comes back. So there's that beautiful moment when really everything kind of falls away right before Paul uses the voice for the first time. It's a beautiful trick when done subtly, and you can't tell that it's happening because you really don't want to say, "Oh, they're doing this," you know. You don't want to pull out all the sound, so you do it very subtly. Like certain elements start to drop away, you still hear the wind chime, but maybe the air is coming down. You're like, you sense something unnerving is going to happen, and you don't know what. And then by the time you get there, it's like only that sound hits you, and that low end starts, as we discussed, like moving it out of sync. Uh, and so you're like, wow, what's that? And he's like, you feel that he's conjuring something. And then there was all about layering of what sounds where, like, okay, does the, the gene voice come in right away or does it start with Paul and go into her? So we experimented a lot with that of, of exactly who's coming in where, how much of each attack of each syllable is which character. So it's many layers, obviously, but uh, it's all about when and where, and it's all within a very short time. Right. So it's extremely touchy. Like you move one thing, you're like, ah, it's ruined. You know, we'd start again, and like, no, that's not it. So it, you're right. It was a ton of experimenting. And the thing is that once we nailed it in that most, and you feel it, and and you know that you have like that kind of uh, impact, that kind of physical experience that we were looking for, and and that is totally connected with the meaning of the voice in the book, then my fear was, but what about if someone listened to it on a, on a, on a very low-tech device, you know? And uh, that's where uh, Ron's genius and, and Doug's uh, and Bill, uh, came, the, the, how to make sure that this will also make sense in the low-tech uh, environment. And that was the challenge. That was my fear that we will lose the effect, uh, uh, but you, you succeed. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really fun conversation. Thank you to Denis and Team Dune for sitting down with us in person to discuss that movie. Next up is No Time to Die. This is from episode 101, which we posted last November. And uh, in this interview, we talk with supervising sound editor Oliver Tarney, who is receiving his fifth Academy Award nomination for No Time to Die. We're recording mixer Paul Massey, who is getting his 10th Oscar nomination and uh, won previously for Bohemian Rhapsody, as well as re-recording mixer Mark Taylor, who is uh, receiving his fourth nomination for No Time to Die and previously won for the movie 1917. Also nominated in this category are Simon Hayes and James Harrison. Paul, Oliver, Mark, thanks so much for taking the time today to talk to us about No Time to Die. It's Bond 25. It's Daniel Craig's final go round as the James Bond character. I'm kind of curious for each of you, how did you get involved with the film? And what was it like to kind of come into this storied franchise for Bond 25 and Daniel Craig's final turn with the character? Well, it was obviously um, a huge honor, to be honest. Uh, growing up in England, just as Mark and Oliver have as well, it's you know it's sort of carrying the Union Jack franchise, and uh, it's obviously something that you're you know everyone I think who who works in sound would love to work on a Bond at some point in their career. So uh, it was a huge honor, and uh, I, I managed to get on board uh, because of Michael Solinger and Oliver and Mark, uh, and all of us being hired as as a team. And uh, it was a great honor also to find out that it was going to be. Daniel's last film. Um, I didn't know that going in. So uh, it was great. Mark and I had worked on um, the first two of the Daniel Craig um, 
movies. Mark was the effects mixer on both, but uh, I was one of the effects editors under Eddie Joseph, I uh, was the supervisor on um, the first two. So, you know, for, I think maybe for us, there's a nice symmetry to working on the first two and then and then just to bookend it with the last one. And for me to be an effects editor at the, the beginning of that arc of the Daniel Craig thing and then finish it off. And uh, James Harrison also was on those two and he was my uh, co-supervisor on it as well. So there's a, a really nice symmetry to, to all that. And I, I even spoke to uh, Eddie Joseph the other day just to catch up with him and, you know, say that we've all been reminiscing um, you know, and what a, a nice project uh, Casino Royale was. So it was a really nice way to to finish that, um, yeah, Daniel Craig era. And I did the same job <laughs> for all three. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I've moved on a bit, but <laughs> maybe not as far as Oliver and James. <laughs> so I want to ask you, one of the things I noticed about the film, you know, the Bond films typically start with a huge sort of action set piece that precedes the main titles. But this one starts very differently. It's almost a very kind of intimate uh, sequence uh, in, in Norway with Madeleine Swan as a child and then the, the first reveal of the villain and then that sort of that brilliant sequence with the on the ice pond and then falling through the ice. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about the approach to... Um, to setting the tone for the uh, for no time to die and that that specific work that went into that first sequence and and kind of what it what it was like to sort of play against the type of starting with a huge bombastic action sequence in the film. Yeah, was, I think it was the first section that we got to work on. We we started midway through filming um, just because the back end was going to be really tight. So whilst they were filming, um, we were given that as a just a standalone section to work on. Um, yeah, it was quite surprising to. To see how they're going to start the film on a, on a first viewing, but it's you know Kerry definitely you know wants to do things differently to have something fresh, um, and that certainly felt fresh. You know that opening shot you think is Bond on the top shot, you just assume it's going to be, and then it's not. Um, and there's a couple of misdirections there, that being one, and then what he does on, on the ice pond as well. Um, you're expecting something different, um, but it's really beautifully structured um you know and even when he was filming um he was giving feedback to tom and elliot the edit editors about very specific sounds that he wanted um so as we got the section it was pay attention to the sound of the crampons make them really creepy as he's walking through um the slow sliding door you know this very slow sliding door everything was given its space um and so there was this very sort of deliberate feel about everything and then you just suddenly get these bursts of violence and which sort of hit you even more because you've had this sort of space either side. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, a really it sort of you, you knew where you were going into something different. It was a, it was a great first scene for us to work on because um, you sort of have to recalibrate and you go, oh, it's not an all out action film. This is going to be a different type of film. So, it was a, yeah, it was a really good one to work on first. And and so obviously the movie then really kicks into high gear when we go to Italy and there's the sequence where Bond visits Vesper's grave and the explosion and then uh, just an extraordinary, I love that chase sequence on the bridge. And, and obviously after the explosion, you get the, the concussive sound effect and Bond losing his hearing. So he doesn't actually hear the car that's coming up behind him. He just, you know, feels the gunshot go past him. So that to me is like, that's, that's when you know, like, oh, now I'm in the Bond world when that sequence uh, happens. So can you guys talk a little bit about constructing that sequence and the, the idea of the concussion affecting Bond's hearing and then how that sequence on the bridge came together. Oh, you, Ollie? <laughs> I guess, uh, again, you know, it was a, uh, something Kerry was keen on doing. Um, and it, w I guess it was that thing of, and this is partly element, elemental and partly mix, was how detached um, do we go from from the world? You know, are we literally going to play it as no sound? or So we ended up with a sort of muted sound. So um, you kind of felt what, he was feeling his you felt his sort of body um sort of resonating through that rather than um things that he would hear acoustically um so then obviously paul w was using the music then to drive that through um solely until we got onto the bridge um but that was Kerry saying and it was one of those things like do you really want to go this low it's like further 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 it's like okay fine and so you really want to be that that strong uh, an idea all the way through to the bridge. So, you know, he's really brave and, and good like that and trying things out. And, you know, it works, you know, it just takes a little time to put together. But, um, yeah, it, yeah, it was a, re a really good sequence. And it's a nice snap out. It really is quite a shocking uh, 
you know, with the car right behind him. And then it's a very violent sort of sound as the, as the car skids over the stone. And, um, and then we're fully, yeah, full tilt into action then. Yeah. And we did, we did find also that with that treatment on, on the, uh, his, his breathing and vocals and gasps and, and all of the sound effects that even the music was going to come in a little bit too bright there, even with the low bass lines. So, uh, so that got filtered back a little bit as well. Um, Mm -hmm just to try and match the overall tone of, of him running towards the bridge. Uh, it was a really brave idea. It works really well. And it's nice not just to have a, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the eight K tone to simulate deafness. It was nice to have it, it be in him, in his, his POV, his all POV of that situation. Talk to me about the recording of the, um, uh, getting the, the the car sounds on the cobblestones in that little Italian village. I, I presume you can't just go down to the a little Italian village and do field recordings of, you know, uh, an, an extraordinarily expensive car ripping around this historic city. How did you go about constructing all that material? <laughs> on production, they did exactly that. Um, they, they ripped around a historic Italian city for, for quite a few days in some um, DB5s. But um, uh, no, we, we hired... Um, a proving ground, a car proving ground um, here for two days. And um, so they've got straight tarmac um, track that you can go and record on, but also every kind of dirt track or grass or curbs or cobble or water, everything. So um, we didn't run the DB5 through water, but um, we were to very specific instructions what we could and couldn't do with that car. But um, pretty much you could, you could get, we, we had uh, the three Aston Martins, the motorbike um, and the Land Rover and the Toyota. And um, we were allowed to, you know, have two days of just with the stunt, proper stunt, stunt drivers doing every surface and every car. And, um, yeah, it was fantastic. It was great. It was one of those ones where, you know, you, um, you, you wonder, yeah, is it you're getting paid to go and spend <laughs> two days messing around with classic cars. And, um, yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, fantastic. Did you have the the actual DB5 with you? It was the wrong color. It was right. red, but Mark <laughs> managed to EQ the red out of it, and okay, so good. it did sound silver. Okay, good. thank well, you. Well, I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I um, I wanted to ask you uh, one of my favorite moments uh, in that whole Italy sequence is uh, we're in the car uh, <clears throat> with Bond and Madeline in the square, and he's getting shot at, and it's just bullet after bullet after bullet hitting the, 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 you know, the bulletproof glass on the car. And, uh, it's the sound treatment inside the car is so remarkable as those bullets are, are hitting. And I'm just curious about how you guys, uh, built and constructed that sequence. Cause it's so, it's so tense and it's so wonderful that of course, Daniel Craig is just being there cool as a cucumber. He knows, he knows his, his windshield is not going to give out on him. <laughs> well, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's just that as well. I think he's processing, you know, what's just happened emotionally. Um, what you know, he thinks he's being betrayed. So I think he's. Um, I, I don't think it's just confidence in the car. I think it's um, yeah, a little bit more than that. But again, it was um, a carry note to have it. He he really is aware of the environment mix wise. Um, and and was very clear that he wanted that assault to feel like a three sixty kind of assault rather than being sort of front heavy with a little bit of surrounds it was like i want it to feel you know the pressure the spl kind of coming from um from everywhere so you did feel you were in this thing just literally you know immersed in bullets coming at you and we had to build up a huge library of because there were so many of them and they're all coming out of all the speakers we had to have a huge palette of um sounds for the impacts and and different ones as it sort of rickos off or it's more of a direct hit like a thunk or a skid um, and then at the very end, just as it starts to starts to give and you just get those little crystals kind of starting to fall, which snaps him out and goes, OK, fine. Finally, the car is going to give way. I do have to do something. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a great sequence. It was tricky. You know, if, if you and I remember, I think we switched formats quite a few times when we were mixing that one to make sure that in, surround, in, in Atmos or 7.1 or 5.1, it felt comparable because um, obviously each format, there are slight variations in how surrounds um feel um and so yeah i I remember i think flicking between the various formats and making sure that um it was going to feel right between whichever format you saw that it was going to stay true obviously the uh the enhanced low end in in surrounds uh using atmos were were really put to use at that point um in that scene but yeah as as oliver says (laughs) when we flipped to five one seven one had to make sure it worked too 
<laughs> That's one of my favorite sequences, just the fact that you know not only is he processing what just happened and what's going on, but also the fact that you know that that glass, just sonically, you know that glass is starting to give way. And maybe there's only another dozen gunshots and, and they're going to be dead. It's a great sequence. And, and the way it ends as well, you know, you just, um, you know, it's, it's all super, super serious. And then suddenly, you know, the headlights pop up, the guns come out, the music kicks in, and yeah. it's just pure Bond and, you know, fantastic. Yeah. And Carrie was very um, uh, in, instructive in making sure that the trombone figure there from Hans um, was, was very dominant in the music. Uh, as soon as the as soon as he starts being aggressive again, and the car starts spinning, and he's starting to fire at, at, at the uh, at the guys outside, he, he really wanted that trombone figure to just drive it, which was uh, again a bold choice because there was a there's plenty of other instruments that were driving it as well, <laughs> and two mini guns. And t- <laughs> Thank you once again to Oliver, Paul, and Mark for taking us behind the scenes of the latest James Bond movie. Next up is The Power of the Dog. This is from episode number 105, which we posted in December. And we were really thrilled to have the director, writer, and producer of the film, Jane Campion, in conversation with her sound team. That includes supervising sound editor Robert McKenzie, who is uh, receiving his third nomination for The Power of the Dog and previously won the Academy Award for Hacksaw Ridge. Sound designer David Whitehead, re-recording mixer Tara Webb, who is celebrating her first nomination for The Power of the Dog, and also uh, nominated in this category, though he wasn't able to join us for this conversation, was Richard Flynn. I'm so thrilled to be in conversation with all of you today about The Power of the Dog. I feel like uh, this is exactly the kind of film that I love to have a conversation about the sound on this podcast with, because I, I feel like in our in our part of the world, a lot of attention is often paid to big studio movies with bombastic sequences and big set pieces. And, uh, and The Power of the Dog has a very, very different approach to the sound. Uh, it's really in, in, in parts, it feels minimalist and stark, uh, and, but it's a very, very powerful track, uh, with a lot of incredibly subtle work going on. And so I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you about it. Jane, I want to start with you as the writer and director of the film. How much are you thinking about sound as you write? And does the power of the dog, I'm kind of curious, does the movie sound like you imagined it would as you were writing? You know, I, I, I love sound because as I say, um, it's not something you can see, so it's always, <laughs> obviously, um, has that, you know, like shock value and surprise value and unexpected quality. This film, for me, was like a dream come true because it's, uh, you know, I love subtlety and detail and atmospheres, backgrounds, and that's, that's I think, where my strengths lie. So b- being able to work, having this film and watching it the first time, I was just sitting there so excited about, you know, in my mind, hearing the winds and you know all that kind of subtlety that we could we could bring forth. I mean, one of the things that we found, oh, I found really interesting, and when you know, like I think we, you guys collected some extraordinary sounds um, for that cattle drive material, and you know, they, it was so exciting when I first heard it, and you know, you get really carried away, and you know, it's like the, really the floor is like rumbling like it really is and 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 then you sort of go like I don't know if this is the right character for our film though you know like um it's making those choices all the time like what's excessive you know what's going to actually sit in in the whole palette of the sound palette of film like if that is so intense what what are we saying you know it's that it's it's like pulling back from that temptation to just be enormous to be correct you know to, to, to actually follow those balances that really work in the story. touch one of the things that i don't do is like i don't like to use 
uh, what they call a group ADR, you know, or I, loop group. No, I want actual actors that, you know, we worked with. And so we got our cow hands to come back and be different people because, they, you know, like their performance is actually good, you know. And I, I don't really trust loop group material and um, that, because it, well, it's just people don't know the story, you know, they're not really in it and it can sound very formulaic. Um, so everything that can be done in a handcrafted way is um, all the better for it, I reckon. You got a sore gut? No. You act like it pains you to hit two words together. That's a great example, Jane, of, of, of the detail that you go into and the care you take with all the individuals as well. I mean, as you say, normally we'd have a, a loop group where you get voice extras in to do these voices, but you took the time to cast them, write all of the lines for that um, scene in the kitchen while they're waiting for uh, to find out where Phil is. All the lines were scripted and directed by you and then you sat with Leah and cut them all, went through all the takes and placed them all. And that's just for background loop group. I know, but if I hear one line that is off, if I hear one piece of dialogue that I don't believe, like I feel that is some, you know, you're, sh you're shooting an arrow of doubt right through it. And that's something uh, that's not acceptable. <laughs> so for me, my ear can really hear that, you know? Well, that, that leads me to want to ask a, a, just a process question uh, for Rob and Tara and Dave. How, how involved were you or were you involved during Jane's uh, picture editing process? Were you feeding sounds? Were you in conversation with them about what you wanted to do? So, I mean, I, obviously we want to avoid that kind of that kind of not great situation where the first time Jane hears stuff is on the final mixing stage. That's a recipe for disaster, right? Exactly. So so we, we really circumnavigate that these days by... Um, uh, we're sort of always mixing in a way too. So while Jane's cutting with Pete and we're getting those, um, you know, tracks from Johnny come through and and Jane and Pete are shaping all of that, um, Jane's coming over to, to my room and we're doing, you know, sort of mini mixes, I guess, as we preview sounds and then bounce those down to to groups to then send over to, to Pete to cut in. So we're gradually building up the track over the length of the picture cut. And then Jane and Peter doing their own internal balances in the Abbott and mm. doing their own sort of selection process. So then when we hear that back again, it's a, it's a process of, of natural selection. That's that process. I was just going to say, I think a lot of it also plays uh, is thanks to, you know, um, Richard Flynn, the location sound recordist, and Leah Katz, our dial supervisor, who did such a wonderful job with the dialogue so that when it came to, you know, building the backgrounds, the atmosphere, um, we could really focus on just what we wanted and not, you know, trying to then put things in so that the, um, you know, to smooth out the dialogue and stuff. So we could be really minimalist with it because the dialogue was just so beautiful um, to begin with. And then... I think also, you know, talking about the big bombastic films, like usually with Atmos you think that's what it's there for. But I think this film really lent itself to being mixed in Atmos as well because um, it allowed us to kind of be really specific with those sounds and, you know, we could strip back and then just have, you know, a wind gust moving around the room, which was enough to then make, let the audience feel like they're in that location or using it as a tool for helping with that um, torment between um, Phil and Rose, you know, hearing his footsteps um, in the house when she's upstairs or or the whistling out the window or, you know, Rob can talk more about, you know, the banjo and piano du duel. I felt like that scene really came to life when it was mixed in Atmos. It was really added to that tension. And yeah, I loved that. That's great. Well, Tara brought up one of my favorite sequences in the film, which is the dueling banjo and piano scene between Phil and Rose. Uh, there's not not a, not a syllable of dialogue in this sequence, but it is incredibly tense and fraught, and it's all done through the sound 
and the music. That scene really is built around the um, the editorial and how those two instruments play together. There were the, um, you know, obviously they were both overdubbed, um, not that you'd ever know that from, from listening to it, um, but that really played into the edit as well. So there was a lot of experimentation early on with that while they were cutting the scene early on. Um, and then in the mix, it was, it was, I think the whole film is building up to that moment. You know, when you see this film with an audience, you really feel that all the tension that's being built up with Phil's presence and his, you know, his constant bullying. Um, it really all builds up to, to that point in the film where we get to the, to that piano and banjo duel. So. That was a, you know, a good a good opportunity for us to explore the full dynamic range as well of of what we had, because the audience is literally on the edge of their seats by this point, so we could go down to to almost silence just to hear the creak of Phil's boot um, in the beginning and ending with huge crescendo of the of the banjo. Um, and that was also a good use of the Dolby Atmos because uh, when we're from Rose's perspective down at the piano, we can hear the banjo start right in the in the left rear, and it slowly creeps over the roof as we're coming in on zooming in on Rose. The banjo's approaching us from behind, and then we'll be spread that banjo sound out to take up the whole roof and then use up the halo speakers at the front so you're almost in Rose's head at that point um, for the big crescendo at the end. Thank you to Jane Campion and her team for that well-deserved Academy Award nomination. Finally, we had the sound team behind West Side Story. This is our most recent episode, number 114. And we were joined in this conversation by Gary Rydstrom, the re-recording mixer, supervising sound editor, and sound designer of the film, who is celebrating his 20th Academy Award nomination, having won seven previous Academy Awards for his work in sound. Also joining us in this conversation is scoring mixer, Sean Murphy. Uh, this is his fourth nomination, and he previously won for Jurassic Park. Brian Chumney, the supervising sound editor on the film, who is celebrating his first Oscar nomination for West Side Story. Uh, production sound mixer Todd Maitland, who is getting his fifth Academy Award nomination. And re-recording mixer Andy Nelson, who is celebrating his 22nd Academy Award nomination and his two previous wins. All right, gentlemen, congratulations on your Academy Award nomination for uh, West Side Story. And thank you for taking some time to come on the Dolby podcast today and, and talk to us about it. Welcome. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thanks. thank you. Todd, I want to, I want to turn to you for, for just a minute. Uh, I, I feel like you've become Mr. Musical. Uh, and, in, and in fact, you were just on this podcast. It feels like just a couple months ago when we had Lynn Manuel on talking about Tick, Tick, Boom, which, which was another just a, a fantastic film this year. Um, but I, I have a feeling that West Side Story was particularly challenging in terms of size and scale for you. A lot of big numbers with a lot of people on screen, a lot of mics, I'm sure. Can you talk a little bit about how you, you know, how you approached it and what were the, some of the specific challenges? I know you also had a lot of fun ex experimenting with microphones on this, yes. on this film. No, so this is my 11th musical, and without a doubt, the granddaddy of them all. You know, there's, you know, just so many characters. The moment that I read that script... I was like, this, you know, there are 22 characters and they're singing, fighting, talking, jumping, you know, they're not, you know, they're not your normal sit around a table kind of scene. So 
I realized right from the beginning that I was going to have to actually put together a brand new sound cart. So we built from the ground up a cart with 30 channels of wireless where I could have all sorts of all sorts of outputs going in all sorts of different directions and different mixes for different people um, and in New York City. So the, it's pretty much the idea is that we really recorded a Broadway show on the streets of New York. So that's how we had to prepare for it. And with Steven, you really, there's no room for error. So you really want to double and make sure you do everything properly. So, so that was the first part was getting all of that together. And then the great thing is obviously is that Gary and Andy were on beforehand and we had conversations well in advance. And we even wrote Steven a letter because we all love the sound of a boom microphone more than a lavalier. So you know, for some of these singing pieces, we really wanted to do them on booms. And we wrote Stephen a letter saying and saying that we would love to, on these certain moments, be able to get the boom into the shot and then paint it out. And Stephen wrote us back and said, there'll be no booms in the shot. <laughs> if you have to put a lavalier in there, we can put a lavalier in, which we did only once for the scene where Tony's singing as he's climbing the, as he's climbing the uh, fire escape up to Maria. That's the only time we had one on there. And the reason they let us do it then is because they had a safety rope on his back anyway. So they had to CGI that out. So one of the things, as you alluded to, is our microphones. And I've realized that lavaliers sound very different on every different actor. So what I do now before I start any film is I take an actor, have them come over to me, and particularly on a musical, and I'll set up seven different brands of lavaliers all at chest height. And I'll have my 416 boom microphone overhead, which I find closely mimics a studio microphone. And I'll have the actors sing through it and I'll record them. And then I'll go back and I'll A-B them later. I'll find out which lavalier sounds the best on them, which matches the boom. And then that lavalier will follow that actor from all the way from vocal pre-records all the way through post-production. That is truly amazing. So then uh, Brian and Gary, you know, so you're, you're getting all this stuff in and you've got You've got pre-records, you've got live on set singing, you've got pre-record lip sync on set. It sounds like just an extraordinary amount of material to kind of get through. And I'm just talking about obviously the the, the musical numbers. Yeah, Brian, Brian, did, Brian. Yeah. Luckily, Brian dealt with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was it was it was me, and it was Marshall Wynn, and it was Rich Quinn, and Marilyn McCoppin. I mean, we had a great dialogue team that really were able to go through all this stuff and, and organize it. And it was, you never, there was never a situation where you couldn't find what you were looking for in Todd's tracks, right? It was just like, it was like you, you knew it was there. It was just, you just had to find it sometimes because there was a lot. Um, but man, it was so, everything was so well organized and so easy to work through. It really is a pleasure to work with, with what Todd does. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just having the time to go through and do it. I wanted to ask you, Gary, sort of about tone. Um, uh, Gary, if you could just talk to us about the opening of the movie and the tone and how you use sound design to set the, the tone for this world that we're going to spend the next two hours in. Well, so much of what succeeds, I think, in the uh, in this movie was set up from the from the script, from the this this the story that Spielberg and Tony Kushner put together. And one of the changes they came up, one of the details they came up with, was to start with. Uh, a demolition. So, you know, the first image we have is of the the neighborhood that's going to become Lincoln Center being demolished. So you set up that these, you know, these, our characters are living in a part of New York City that's going away. Um, and it feels, it just adds this great tension. And it's great for me because, you know, the first sounds I get to do is not just city, but a city getting knocked down, old building, buildings getting knocked down, wrecking balls and such. Um, and as my and it, it gave me a great opportunity later on to when we're in uh, Rita Moreno's shop uh, with Tony, we hear you know demolition going on outside the window. We never see it again actually after the first scene, but you know it's there. You know that there's this undercurrent of the world that you know underfoot is disappearing. Um, so that was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant idea. So generally, my job was to make it feel like 1957 New York but a certain part of 1957 New York that was undergoing change. Um, and I, at the same time, and I'll point out one of the um, both difficulties and fun things for a sound effects person to work in a musical. So I get to do 
wrecking balls, right? In the beginning of this movie is great. But there's also this iconic music happening, which is very, in the beginning, the opening is very, got some holes in it, and other, but it's got little detailed percussion and stuff you want to hear. So I've got to do wrecking ball deconstruction and still get out of the way of the music. So that was the challenge for me for the whole movie was to put in the reality of the city, but work within the rhythm and the sound of the music so I don't get in its way. Yeah, and I think one of the things you also, Gary, is that like even in the very beginning when they're tossing paint cans, you know, as they're doing everything, there was so much of this movie that was choreographed and sound and sound effects follow that choreography like that. Um, yeah, they would wear earwigs like all the time on set so we could try to capture as many as we could on set. And then Gary would obviously recreate, you know, everything that we couldn't get there. And but a lot of those sounds are are choreographed. Yeah, the, ry the rhythm of the action is really important. We actually micro, even in the final, you know, we had uh, Steve Bissinger, who was our, sort of our lead sound effects editor, even up to the very end of the final, he would micro synchronize our sound effects so that they worked with the music. Um, so that, you know, those paint cans and other things throughout the movie, everything was just aligned like that. Well, that was a great thing about Steve as well, because he's an effects, he's a musician as well as I mean, a really great musician, as well as an effects editor. So he could bring the musicality to his editing and really, really made it special. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, Sean and Todd, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the the pre-records because it seems like that's such a huge um, element uh, of West Side Story in particular. And one of the, one of the questions I had when, when I'm watching this film is I, I know that there's, you know, Andy's doing this kind of amazing job of diving back and forth between, live singing and pre-records, but then you've, you've got a song like Cool, which is these characters really like, you know, playing keep away with a gun and they're running and jumping and kind of bouncing all over the place. And so how do you pre-record that on a, you know, presumably on a, on a, you know, a very antiseptic music, you know, a sound environment in a, in a, in a recording stage, but kind of have that essence of the performance so that you enable Andy to be able to move back and forth between what he's going to cap what you captured live on the set versus the pre-record. Yeah, well, they, they, you know, uh, Todd's already mentioned that we recorded uh, all all of the vocals with multiple microphones, uh, and we we were and just like Todd said, we were careful to, to use similar uh, or the same boom mic and lavalier mics along with a studio mic. Uh, knowing that, you know, uh, there wasn't just one pre-record session. Uh, there, there, a lot of these songs were recorded multiple times. And, and, and what I have to do is, is mention our, our vocal producer, Janine Tesori, uh, as part of this, because Janine trained all these actors. She, she was in on the audition process and she, uh, trained, trained all the vocalists and, and I think got great performances out of, out of all of them. These actors are singing their own parts. There's no, there's nobody singing uh, for them other, uh, like they're in the previous, uh, West Side Story. So, so they, so the performances had to be good. And we knew that in cool, which is a very complicated number, both musically and cinematically, uh, that, you know, we're going to be a, it's going to be a combination. It's going to be some studio mics. A lot of production is going to be mixed in and it, and it's going to be handed to Andy in a, in a kind of a checkerboard, a system where he gets to choose once he looks at the picture and decides what to use. Obviously, a lot of the shouting, a lot of the motion, a lot of the vocals uh, had to come from from production. Uh, they they couldn't really be pre-recorded, uh, although the melodic material possibly could be. Uh, and we had a we had an editor working with us in the music department, uh, David Channing, who who put together the vocals really in just a kind of wonderfully artistic way where he would he would build these checkerboards of, of different sources, uh, both from pre-records and from production, so that we could give then give it to, to uh, the music editors and to Brian for, for the final dub, and they would have the, the best choices for, for uh, putting the number together. Uh, yeah, complicated. And, and uh, certainly, you know, you think of pre-records just going into the studio for one take. Some of these songs were pre-recorded, uh, a half a dozen times or more before we got the final performances that were going to be the, the best to use. And there was a lot of rehearsal. I mean, Stephen did a ton of rehearsal. I would sit in on those rehearsals and they would work out the timing of everything. And then that was actually the first scene that we shot of the movie. So that was my introduction to Steven Spielberg filming was cool. And cool encompassed everything from every element of playback to earwigs to 
wirelesses to booming to effects to everything was in that whole piece. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm in for. Strap on 78 days of go. <laughs> and it was. Yeah, cool was, was literally very cool to do because it did, um, I mean, for a start, it was mainly choreography. That was the thing that was great about it. So it started off um, with the guys all settling down. Uh, Ansel was, was, was uh, speaking and, and became, it started to sing. So the thing was that, it, it, like all the other sequences, he'd been recorded naturally on set up to the point when we went into the playback for, for his vocal. Sometimes we were in a live situation onto the vocal. Sometimes we were in a playback, depending. This one, I think, was in a playback situation, if I remember rightly. And um, um, But again, with the microphone choices, I was able to always utilize exactly the same microphone that had been used in the dialogue sequence up to that point in time. The studio mic, the fat studio mic, was really obviously more for the sort of album sound, if you like. But obviously what I was always relying on was the lavaliers or the shotgun uh, boom mic, which, uh, whichever worked to match in perfectly. And, um, but, uh, but there was only a couple of um, lines of sung in call because then it goes into a dance. So again, the atmosphere that was created when we first cut to the, to the guys running down to, to start that scene, Gary Rystrom had already brilliantly created the sounds of the water and the, 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 just the air, the openness of the, and the, the wind blowing, um, the, the sheets blowing, things like that, that all created that lovely sound. Then when they got onto the wharf area, of course, there was the, the floor, you know, the, the creakiness of the, the wood floor. And the, um, so it was a question of never letting that die just because vocals came in. It, we kept it very strong and full, knowing that it was going to go into a full-on choreography piece. And um, with, it, with, but it was interspersed with some shouted words here and there from, from the original takes on production. Um, but it was just a great, it was just a great dance piece, really, in the end of the day. It was just about getting that threat and the feeling of the, the guys throwing the gun back and forward between themselves and almost teasing Tony at times, you know, but keeping it... Um, it, it, it had an edge to it and I loved it and it built and built musically and then went down to very, very quiet right at the very end when they basically uh, all left him one by one at the very end of the sequence. And so it had this wonderful build of very quiet at the beginning, full on dance, loud music back down to a very, very quiet end, which um, I thought was a wonderful piece. Yeah. I think the most remarkable thing in this movie is you never for one second don't believe that the singing you're hearing or the acting you're hearing is not happening on that set. It feels completely believable at every time and seamlessly goes in and out of the music. And it's a, uh, it's just a, a wonder. I've never heard a musical be that seamless before. I think that's one of the great achievements of, of this particular movie. Um, and that's, you know, and my, my part was try to, to add the, um, I guess, what I, what I find interesting about this movie is it does combine kind of a, a naturalistic, realistic style, which is what I could bring with ambiences and sound effects, and the stylistic style of singing, which is not natural, and um, you know, the music, which is not natural. And I like that combination of kind of the, the gritty, natural side to it and the uh, ephemeral, musical, stylized side to it. I, I love that combination in this movie. Thank you once again to all of the nominees who have joined us over the course of the recent months to discuss their work in these amazing films, and good luck to you all. You can find links to all the films we've discussed today in our show notes, and you can find the full episodes uh, to each of these conversations in our podcast show feed. But before you go, please make sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have more of our Academy Awards coverage coming up, including our individual episode devoted to best cinematography, uh, but first, we're going to take a little break in the middle of all of this Oscars goodness uh, for a special two-part episode coming up on The Batman, in which I get to sit down in person with uh, co-writer and director Matt Reeves and discuss the film with his sound and his image teams. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in our show notes, or you can just search for Dolby wherever you get your podcast. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab, brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. 
Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening.